moderator for this evening, League of Women Voters board member, Maxine Anderson. Maxine was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and moved to San Francisco in 1978. She graduated with a BA from the University of Illinois and has worked in the insurance industry as well as in local governments. In 2003, Maxine decided she needed to do more than complain about the situation in our country. She needed to become an active participant to make the democracy work. She became involved with the League of Women Voters of San Francisco and participated in the creation of another nonpartisan organization, San Francisco for Democracy. We are honored to have welcome Maxine Anderson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashley, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of, I'm sure, your busy days to come here and hear what the candidates for District 10 Supervisor want to tell you about what they're going to do for all of you, for all of us, since they also represent the city. Now, first of all, um, I'm gonna go through the procedures and rules for this particular forum. This evening, you will be hearing from four of the five candidates for the District 10 representative on the Board of Supervisors. They will have a chance to present their views on issues affecting the city and District 10 and to answer your questions about those <coughs> issues. To submit questions for the candidates, look for a volunteer. Could a volunteer raise their hand? Look for a volunteer who will be handing out index cards. And we will be collecting all the cards, all the cards with the questions by 6.30 so you have a minute. I wish to remind you of our ground rules. No literature, campaign signs, or buttons may be distributed or posted inside this meeting room. Candidates and their supporters are expected to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to help maintain quiet during the forum. Candidates are asked to make no personal attacks on other individuals. We're here to hear what you're going to do. Tell us. Candidates are asked to make, we also ask that no videotaping or flash photography occur because SFGov TV is taping this forum for broadcast. And you'll also, again, be able to get it um, on their website. And here are the procedures for the forum. The candidates will each have one minute to answer questions you and the audience submit, as well as questions that have been submitted to the League of Women Voters website, www.sfvotes.org. Each candidate will answer every question. Any rebuttals may be included in the candidate's closing statement. The timekeepers in the first row, here they are, <laughs> will hold up a yellow card to signify to the candidates that they have 15 seconds remaining and will hold up a red card when it's time to stop. All candidates have agreed to ask their supporters to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to maintain quiet during the forum. I ask you to respect that commitment. Every aspect of the forum will be equally fair to all candidates. You have many important decisions you have to make on November the 4th. Today's forum will give you an opportunity to be heard. Now, let's begin. The questions will be asked. We're gonna start with the first question and we're going to go in alphabetical order, okay? So the first question will go to Ms. Cohen, okay? How would you combat generational poverty citywide? Citywide. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. I'm glad you're committed to the uh, city and county of San Francisco and, and the democratic process. My name is Malia Cohen. I'm an elected member of the Board of Supervisors representing the southeastern neighborhoods of Baby, Pachero, and Visitation Valley. Ms. Anderson? 
the question is, is how do you go about how would you combat generational poverty? Genera citywide? Sure, generational poverty is actually a vicious cycle. The way I would go about and continue to go about. Are we still going on? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, don't okay. look at me. That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It's by education, increasing the quality of education and 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 building bridges between the young people and uh, the families and the community. Wraparound services, using schools as a center hub to connect with families that are connected to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the same question will go to Mr. Donaldson. Can we stand or can we remain oh. seated in light of the microphone? You can remain seated. Uh, good evening and thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ed Donaldson. I'm a lifelong resident here in Bayview Hunters Point. Um, also a finance professional, and um, the question is, is, is definitely in line with my expertise around finance. Um, living in a capitalistic society, I mean, we have to teach people how to compete. We also have to, to ensure that we have quality educations uh, in every neighborhood, not just in some neighborhoods of San Francisco. We also have to focus on how the city budget is spent and how it's distributed and make sure that we are doing things in a very equitable manner. As it relates to development in this district, we have the opportunity to extract from these development what's called community benefits. And we have the opportunity to spend these community benefits in a very equitable way, creating equity strategies that help lift people out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony Kelly, running for, Tony Kelly, running for supervisor. The great, the great levelers in poverty in this part of the city are education, transit, make it easier to get to work, jobs, and housing. The city has fallen down on its responsibilities in the last four years to do so. We need massive investment, and we actually have the wealth to do it. But in the last four years especially, we have a city hall that is desperate to chase money on the big money in downtown, but has been avoiding investing it in this part of town, in this district, and somehow we act, how, we act like, like poverty is a natural disaster. It is not. Policies have put us in this position. Policies can bring us back, but we need change and leadership to get that kind of investment. We need, and I have experience in trying to find those sources and trying to use to managing our growth and trying to use our city's vast resources of wealth to actually invest in our communities. That's what we need to do. We need to have a change in approach at City Hall. Thank you very much. Mr. Richard? Well, we all agree, uh, Sean Richard, uh, running for District 10 supervisor, and we all agree um, education is very important. That's first and foremost. But we also got to look at the living wages that we're paying our people in San Francisco. We're not paying them enough. And that's why they're moving out and that's why they're struggling. So we have to start holding City Hall accountable across the board on where they're standing with this community, with other communities, with the poverty period around this country. Has What Barack has been saying from day one is that nobody should be left behind on what they're trying to do in America, in the United States of America today. And we have to understand that our, our district has been struggling for a long time. And across the board, San Francisco, if you look at the main districts, two, four, six, eight, and 10, all those districts has been struggling. And so we have to make sure that we hold those districts accountable, along with holding City Hall accountable, work together and build education, along with having a better living wages and hold City Hall accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much. The second question, and it'll go first to Mr. Donaldson, okay? How can, how can District 10 retain its unique character, character while at the same time benefit from the best of the new economy and what that offers? Well, it, it, go back, it goes back to the question of equity. I mean, San Francisco is the most inequitable city or it has the fastest rate, uh, growth rate of inequality than any other city in the country. And we have to look at that. And we also have to look at, you know, with all of this new development that's going on, how do we ensure that we get the developers to commit to infrastructure improvements as well as to community benefits? Because those resources that come in a form of community benefits become an opportunity for this community to compete, whether it's around uh, creating uh, job opportunities or job training programs, whether it comes to uh, creating our own unique 
district-wide housing program in light of the housing pressures. These are things that I have experience with, and these are things that I have done, you know, uh, uh, leading up to this election. So I'm not talking about something that I'm going to do when I get in office. I'm talking about what I'm doing right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kelly? Sure. Um, I have, some, I have some specific experience with this because there was a big rezoning of the Mission Potrero and South of Market done over the last 10 years, and I led the multi-neighborhood coalition that was trying to fight that and do a better job of delivering for the neighborhoods. And we're seeing broken promises on that right now to the point where there's about a half a billion dollars or more of pr uh, increase in property taxes going to the general fund in the next 15 years. And right now, none of that is targeted to investments in the neighborhood in improved infrastructure, in improved services. We need to do that. I wrote up a legislative package with my neighborhood association last year to present that it's a legislative agenda that no one on the board has taken up. It is a clear legislative agenda. We need to do that, and we need to use that here to manage growth here because 80% of District 10 has been rezoned in the last 10 years. So the increase in population and the increase in development is coming. We need to manage it and put some standards in there to make sure that we get our share of infrastructure and services along with it to keep people here. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Richard? Well, one of the things is we have to start looking at, one of, one of the things I work with, with the Merchant Association in, in Bayview and also on San Bruno Avenue, we have to start looking at what is the key points to start making sure that we have some stake in what's going on in this district. Bottom line is that if we don't hold City Hall accountable and we don't start making sure that they put enough money in the general funds to help operate this district and make this district, be make this district better for what we're trying to move forward in for the next five to ten years, we're going to be failing everyone, everyone that's trying to be a part of this. So we have to look at the bigger picture. And overall, the bigger picture is, is that this city has $8.6 billion. And part of this city is part of this district is not seeing none of that. So we have to make sure we understand where is the equity going. Do we have a stake in this in this city? Do we have a stake in this district? And what can we do to fix that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cohen. Thank you. In order to retain our unique culture here in the Bayview community, <coughs> here in Dog Patch and then within the Visitation Valley neighborhoods, I think we need to recognize and honor the working class neighbors. And um, how do we do that? We honor them by increasing their min the minimum wage. Also, what we also have done earlier in the year is we preserve the Bayview Opera House as a hub for culture, education, and training. Also, I introduced and passed legislation for the African American Freedom Trail that specifically calls out the significant contributions the African American community has given to the city and county of San Francisco. When you think about Pier 70 and that development project, the maritime um, legacy uh, along the, 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 uh, the dog patch neighborhood is also is equally as significant. So preserving that uh, legacy through arts, through culture, through teaching, and passing on these traditions to our future generation. The other thing we also must do is continue to support the small businesses. I worked to pass legislation and have been a longtime supporter of small businesses. Sam Jordan is designated as a landmark. Thank you. Thank you very much. This next question, which will go to Mr. Kelly, sure. is... Bring it. Beg your pardon? Oh, I'm, just, I'm ready for it. You're ready? I'm ready. Okay, good. He's ready. <laughs> okay. For all, any of you who drove in tonight, you know sometimes traffic can be a little hectic here in the city lately. So what are your thoughts on transportation policy how, and how that affects District 10? And another question, how did you get here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I drove here tonight because I want to make sure I was here 15 minutes early and I can't trust the tea. <laughs> I wish I could, and I wish more people would take the tea to work, but if you take that train to work, you don't have that job anymore. And so we need to make sure the tea, the tea is reliable and improved, and that the bus systems are improved. We have more folks who ride the bus over here, and Muni has been steady, steadily cutting transit and buses at the same time that we are doubling the population of District 10 in the next 20 to 30 years. That is nothing but a bizarre medical experiment, and in a part of town where a child born today in Bayview can expect to live 14 years less than a child born on Russian Hill, that is dead wrong. 
We already have two freeways. We have a lot of air, water, and ground pollution. We need to invest seriously in transit, and we don't have the attention paid at City Hall to do that. The District 8 supervisor is running Muni from his seat. The District 10 supervisor has the opportunity to do that too, and we don't even have a backup to the T for switchbacks the way they do on the N line in District 4. There are specific things we need to do, we need to do now. Thank you. Mr. Richard? Well, I drove too. Um, I was here since five o'clock sitting outside. Um, but I think I come from, from the old school and I remember the Third Street bus. And I know you guys are familiar with that. We, we brought the T-line in and it, it helped, kind of, sort of. But actually we need to bring in more transportation to help out this district because a lot of kids I know that I have talked to are getting to school late and the T-line is only going so far, the 24 is going so far, and the other buses are not on time. The 54 is running slow, and in 54, if you know it, it goes, and from what my kids tell me, cross country. <laughs> and, we, and we know that. So we need to fix that, and we need to improve that. And that's something that, as supervisor, that's something that I would take a hard look into, and I will make sure that that be put in place so that my kid don't get to school, and she's a 14-year-old, but she goes to Burton now, but she still, it still takes her 20 minutes to get there on the bus. It's unacceptable. So I will look into that and I'll make sure that every kid get to school on time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much. When we think about transportation policy, I'm really reminded about growing up here in the city and how I took the bus to and from school um, and how frustrating it was to, to wait for um, these buses to to finally arrive, and when they did arrive, they were crowded. What's remarkable is that these are the same problems that we still have today. That's important, that the reason why we have an initiative on the ballot this, this coming up November um, is to address the growth of the southeastern part of the city to account for the transportation. The VLF, that's the vehicle license fee, this is a piece of legislation that will be on the ballot in 2016, also equally as critical, because it will help us fund the much needed repairs that, are, are, that we need to have on the T. Now on the Board of Supervisors, I was able to call a hearing to address the T-line and the switchback issues, where we were able to actively increase the turnaround time and decrease the number of switchbacks that occur inside, uh, in the Dogpatch neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Donaldson. Well, we need to be bold like Scott Weiner was. Uh, he put a ballot initiative on the ballot where he directly challenged the mayor who had treated Muni as if it was a byproduct. And what it does, it ties the funding of Muni to the population growth. And if it passes, the city will owe Muni $20 million. Support that ballot measure. Definitely, because it put pressure on the mayor to make sure that he's accountable in terms of funding Muni uh, with general funds money. The other thing we need to do, we need to look at the region, because transportation is a regional issue. And 80% of federal transportation dollars that come down, comes down through the region. Or 80% or of it goes to the suburbs. 20% comes to the city. Suburbs have 30% of the population, cities have 70% of the population, so it's an inequitable funding stream. We need to look at how we can change that, how we can advocate against it, so that we can receive more of those funds to finance Muni. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, this next question, we'll start with Mr. Richard on it, and it's a two-part question, actually. Two questions, but they pretty much go together. Um, one of them, and it's all about housing. Um, it, right now it appears the city has a citywide housing lottery that compete with neighborhood people getting into housing. So would you, do you have any plans to address that issue? And again, going to housing. Um, recently, Senator Leno's Ellis Act uh, legislation failed in assembly committee. Um, is there anything you feel that you can do as a supervisor that will help to limit those Ellis Act evictions in San Francisco? Well, the first part um, of the question in regards to um, the housing, I feel that um, we need to take a stronger look at what's going on with housing around the city with the, uh, the lottery and how people are being migrated out of San Francisco and how they're not having a chance in a fair act, a fair chance to stay in San Francisco. Um, 
I, I don't have a plan in place, but I will be open to sit down with who's an expert at put on the lottery and what we can do in regards of the lottery and how we can fix that to make it where folks can stay in San Francisco without being ran out of San Francisco. Um, the, the, the second part, as far as the LS Act, I think we need to go up to uh, Sacramento and fight with Sacramento about the LS Act. Uh, my mom was part of that eviction LS Act uh, of a slumlord who did not want my mom in that house because she was on a uh, fixed income and he wanted to move up the, uh, the, the rent. So I think that we need to take a look at that and we need to fight up at Sacramento with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much. Yes, um, you know, the citywide, the citywide lottery is actually a joke. It's unfair. What it does is it pits neighbor against neighbor. We need to reform this, this particular let, this let, uh, lottery. And let me tell you what I'm doing to do that. In Washington, D.C., we've got the HUD. Here in San Francisco, there's a misunderstanding that um, the mayor's office of housing governs, uh, governs um, the rules when it comes to HUD and HUD rules of leasing and renting out housing. We actually, we actually have an opportunity that I've been able to partner with, with Kathy Davis where we were successfully able to get baby residents in housing on along the Jamestown uh, Street in the baby community back near Candlestick. That is a perfect example of a partnership between neighbors and my office working together to make sure that baby residents or residents that are living in San Francisco have an opportunity to capitalize on all of this um, housing that's coming down the pipeline. Also, our housing hub is at San Francisco Housing Development Corporation. That is ground zero when it comes to the influx of homes that are going to be coming onto the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Donaldson. Having worked for eight years at San Francisco Housing Development Corporation, I came to the conclusion that the lottery was illegal. It's in violation of the federal fair housing laws because it produces a discriminatory outcome. I have been looking at how to sue the city to bring about a change in it. And a lot of that discussion around lawsuits has, been, has compelled the city to do some things such as respond to the Jamestown project by opening it up and not using the lottery. Also, as far as the Ellis Act is concerned, I, I believe, I strongly believe, having worked on state legislation before, it took us three years to pass what was called the Homeowner Bill of Rights. So it wasn't going to take one year to get an Ellis Act law changed. It was going to take a prolonged effort. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing whether the mayor is committed to it for the long haul. As far as a solution around Ellis Act evictions, I would give nonprofits the first right of refusal to buy places and, and maintain the affordability level of them. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? Sure. I like following Ed on housing questions because it's very easy for me to say I support everything he said about the lottery. I believe it's illegal and we need to, need to do a legislative fix or a litigation fix to it. Second, we need, to be, we need to be tough and regular and strong about our eviction standards in the city's housing. There was a report that came out last, just a couple of months ago from the Eviction Defense Collaborative where one in three evictions in the city last year was of an African American and one in four evictions was, from, was on city-owned or funded property. So the biggest evictor in the city of San Francisco is the city of San Francisco. That needs to change. It needs to change. We need leadership at the board to do that. I'm proud to be one of the sources for David Campos legislation that passed earlier this year to raise prices, to raise the fees paid to Ellis relocation victims in a way to try to, you know, take some, some of the incentive out of the Ellis Act evictions and to give those residents a chance to stay in the city. I'm very proud to be one of the sources of that legislation. That's the work I want to do. You won't see me telling the press that evictions aren't a problem in this district, and someone up here at this table has. Thank you very much. And with our next question, we're going to switch the subject a little bit to safety in the, in the community. So the question is, and it will go to you, Ms. Cohen, what will you do to see that our seniors and our kids are safe in the community? Seniors and our sick kids? Yeah. So when I think about safety, I think about it in a very holistic perspective. This is the work that we have done. We've got ambassadors on the platforms that are, that are along the merchant corridors to ensure that there are safety um, on the muni buses. And it is a crime that the city has allowed crime to travel and to uh, persist on our transportation. When I think about safety for the seniors, I think about those that are really fragile and very vulnerable, that are afraid to engage. How do we increase this? By increasing more police 
and also increasing not just um, not just um, officers that are in uh, that are in uniform, but also people that are committed to being a part of the community. Um, a vigilante, for example, I've been in contact and speaking with the. Um, the guardian angels as well as the uh, fruit of Islam to ask them to step up their advocacy to be a part of the community and help provide that level of safety not just for seniors not just for young people but for all people along our merchant corridors so people can shop and begin to support the small business along the corridors thank you thank you very much <laughs> mr. Donaldson you know, when you when you talk about public uh, safety the first thing that comes to mind is the gun violence in the community and uh, it's interesting because the city of Richmond launched a program in 2007 where they identified 25 individuals who were responsible for 70% of 242 shootings. Guess what they did? They went and got those 25 individuals and they set them down and they built a partnership with them that consequently has reduced the gun violence in Richmond. Their homicide rate went from 47 in 2007 to 16 last year. The expectation was to be in single digits this year, but the point is, is that they have had no gang-related homicides since 2012. In San Francisco, I'm willing to bet, we probably have the same 25 to 30 individuals who are responsible for gun violence. And these are young men and women who have not had an investment. There's nothing to stop a bullet better than a, a job, right? Young people need opportunities. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. There's more than one fragile population in District 10. And like Ed said, we need to invest in all of our fragile populations, and that's the only way we're going to get out of our crime problems because, you know, every officer, any officer, any criminologist will tell you we cannot arrest our way to a safety, to a safety solution. We need to invest. We know our likely um, offenders are going to be disconnected youth from their families between 18 to 25 and ex-offenders. We have up to 1,500 ex-offenders released into the community every year. We have a reentry council at the city level, out of the sheriff's department, of all sorts of city officials to manage policy about ex-offenders and to look for funding to support ex-offenders. There's a board of supervisors seat on the reentry council. That seat is vacant, has been vacant for some time. The District 10 supervisor has to serve on that council. We have too many broken families. We have too many ex-offenders coming into the community who do not get enough services or placement. And then, we get, and then we're surprised about our crime problems. How does that work? So we need a much more personal commitment from the supervisor to work on that. Thank you. And Mr. Richard? Well, I'm going to start back. I'm going I'm to go backwards. As far as the seniors, we have to engage them and get them involved with the community relation boards. Back in the days, it was the community relation board that stood up before the board, I mean, before the commission of the um, police department and let them know that we're here. And I disagree with having more police. I, I think that we need to get the community more involved and more engaged. Being that I come from uh, a prevention part of uh, what I do, uh, Brothers Against Guns, we have held uh, 25 to 30 youngsters where we put them to work and we engage them with city and county employee, employ them with, in city and county jobs. And from there, they went on to be full-time employees. And still to this day, we, employ, we got 60 youngsters working in that program. And right now to this day, it's 47 is still working. So I know that it can be something done if we just put our heads together and we engage and we bring back the necessary people to sit at the table and address these issues. We had a homicide last night. So where, where is the community at? The community was right out there dealing with that. So we have to get the community back involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. For this next question, it's going to be in two parts. Because the question was asked, um, what would you do to address blight, dilapidated properties, and public nuisances in the district? But going along with that was a question about um, a homeless encampment I believe at 17th in Kansas, and how can we, how can the Board of Supervisors address the issue of homelessness in the city? And that question goes to Mr. Donaldson. So the first part was dilapidated properties? And blighted properties, yeah. In the district. And also the issue of homelessness. Well, well, I, I, when you say dilapidated properties and blighted properties, I, I, I take it as a twofold question, both residential as well as um, uh, commercial spaces. Um, as far as the uh, residential side, 
you know, I started a company that actually buys foreclosed properties and put families back in them. That's what I've been doing for the last two years. I actually left SFHDC to actually start this company, um, um, and I'm still running it to this day. As far as the commercial properties, the challenges we have along Third Street is that the income levels in the community are not high enough to attract retailers to occupy those spaces. But we're not looking at how to incentivize retailers to come into the area, such as we did with Radio Africa. Radio Africa on the corner of 3rd and Oakdale, there's no coincidence that that restaurant is there. We asked him what did he need. He said he needed help with the rent. We granted him free rent. He's still there today thriving because of the free rent that we provided him with. So we can do this. We just have to be creative with our thinking. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. You know, San Francisco is such a great liberal progressive city until money gets involved, and this is one of those cases where that is, because we claim that we're broke, we can go in and chase tax breaks for tech companies and downtown developers, but we somehow can't invest in the investment and case management we need to improve all of our neighborhoods, and that's exactly how it plays out here. Um, I'm going to back up what Ed said about Third Street and blighted properties. We actually need to contact, we need direct contact and direct work with owners and landlords about that, and we also need to make sure there's less incentive about keeping it vacant so we can actually tax blighted properties, we can tax vacant properties actually on Third Street and also incentivize businesses moving in. And then also on the homeless um, situation, the homeless outreach team has been cut. Which, and everyone knows that that's the way which we need to have direct contact with homeless folks. And we should not be surprised that in this booming economy that is displacing people out of their homes, and you cut the homeless outreach team, and you cut shelter beds, we can't be surprised that there is an increase in our homeless problem. So we need to address that. And the board is the last word on the budget and needs to be much stronger about getting funding for it. Thank you. Mr. Richard. So again, I, I go back to this, and I say this all the time, $8.6 billion in San Francisco and we're not addressing the real issues. And small businesses are failing in District 10. Small businesses are not being seen, what they are not, are not given what they should, they should be given to be able to address, you know what I'm saying, their business to grow. We're not investing into, this, in, into small business. Uh, I once was told that small business can go on the website and look and figure out how to get a grant. That doesn't make no sense to me. It's not acceptable. And we have to figure out what can we do to support them and make them build up so we can hire young folks in our community, and, we can invest, and, the, and then the city can invest back into those business by giving them a tax break. That's one. As far as the homeless, we have 1,500 homeless people in District 10, and we're not addressing it. We, we're trying to shut down Mother Brown for whatever reason, I don't know, and, 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 and we, we can figure that out. But at the same time, we have to address the homeless situation in District 10. We have to support who wouldn't want beds in District 10 that's, that's bringing beds to this district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much. Um, there's a couple things here when I think about um, blight and public nuisance. First of all, I think we need to give the baby community a voice. When the project area committee was disbanded due to, due to the disbandment of the redevelopment agency, it took our voice away when it comes to land use and economic and development. I put a body in place, the Bayview CAC, that meets on a regular basis that deals with the land use issues that we are talking about here today. Also, I put, put together a code enforcement team that has, that model has been taken and is citywide. It deals specifically with code enforcement of blight, not just residential but also commercial properties. Also, these banks that come in and they foreclose in our community, how the heck do we get them to be accountable? Well, I've increased the penalties for them, and the, uh, district, uh, and the city attorney's office is going after and prosecuting um, these bad actors. So uh, when I think about um, the homeless shelter, homeless is a really interesting issue. I believe that everyone in this room would agree that Mother Brown's soup kitchen is doing a good job in feeding people. But what we have to pay attention to is that a concentration of poverty is not going to help us. A concentration of poverty actually help, hurts the people that we are very, that the very people that we are looking to uplift and to support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any rebuttal? rebuttal? No. That Rebuttals? Um, again, rebuttals you can handle during your closing statements. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. This next question is um, a bread and butter question, basically. And what it is is, what is your plan for addressing the food desert or the scarcity of supermarkets in District 10? Is there anything we, you feel you can do? Well, I'll, I'll give one. I'll, I'll go first, right? 
That's correct. I'll give one specific example that I've been talking about to people ever since uh, a third on third meeting a few months back. I know folks who run grocery stores in the city and when Fresh and Easy closed and the city's been casting about trying to find a solution to that really predictable closure, uh, the grocers I talked to said, of course, you know, of course it was going to happen like that because they're a multinational corporation and they're going to get out um, for some of the reasons that Ed mentioned about Third Street. And no, they don't want to take on the store themselves. The community should. So let me just you know, paint, a, paint a picture of a possibility. There's a group in, in the East Bay, the People's Grocery. They've done this. They've developed groceries that are homegrown, working with neighborhoods in the East Bay. We need to invite them in here. We then need folks in the community who are willing to step up and be in front and manage that. And then we need to get free rent out of the landlord. And that's a, that's a little bit of what Ed talked about with Third Street, but we need to do it so it's homegrown for us, by us, because that's the only way it's going to be sustainable and in tune with the needs of the community and get a real grocery store that works for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Richard. So I agree with what Tony Kelly just said, and I think that we also need to look at bringing in fresh fruit and fresh vegetables into this district. And we're struggling with that because we have no outlet and we're going to uh, Bayshore Farmer's Market and we're going to other different areas to get fresh food. But as far as the supermarket, I think that we have to also what Tony Kelly just said is bring in community folks that want to own their own business and teach them how to run a supermarket to own their own business and that way you have, they have a stake in that and that way it can stay and it can grow and it can get bigger and from there other folks can come in and start working in that supermarket and we can develop an outcome that everybody in this district can see that is benefiting them across the board because right now we're struggling and we're struggling we, we only have two supermarkets in this district we have Safeway on Patrol, and we have Fulco. And we just opened up another one, um, Super Save, not Super Save, but Grocery, grocery Outlet, outlet and, and which is good. But I think that we could do better and we can do more. Again, I keep alluding to this. We have $8.6 billion. We can do a lot. Thank you very much. Ms. Cohen. Thank you. You know, you would think by the tone and tenor of some of the folks on this, on this panel that the baby was just like hurting and, um, and that we're all broke down and decrepit and just can't survive. And the, rea the reality is, is that baby is strong and it is resilient and it has survived and it will continue to survive and that people that want to remain here will be able to remain here. The Southeast Food Access Network is a nonprofit organization that is on the ground that is doing what? Taking one thing that we have an over proliferation of, that's gr uh, liquor stores, and turning them into bastions of green healthy food. So we have re been, we've been worked with these businesses to reconfigure these liquor stores so that they can serve fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. And we've also reached out to Mandela Market, which is what, um, what was discussed earlier today, this, uh, uh, a co-op. And it's an, interesting, it's an interesting model, certainly that um, may or may not be sustainable. Um, but I also want to call your attention to Grocery Outlet that's in Visitation Valley that opened up in June that is alive and doing very well and vibrant and is serving the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Donaldson? When you, when you say food desert, I think one, the quality of the food, and then two, just the presence of food. Um, as it relates to the quality of food, I point back to Radio Africa and the way in which we incentivize them to come here and to stay here. They serve fresh, organic, clean food. And me, I'm a picky eater. And when I look at a menu, and if it's something that I don't understand, you know, I won't necessarily choose it, but when I see the plate, I'll choose it very healthy, good, clean food. We brought that restaurant here because of that. The second thing, when supermarkets operate at a very low profit margin, and if the income levels in a community is not high enough, they will not come and they will not stay. Fresh and easy open at a loss. And it, the reason they did that because they was trying to uh, saturate the market, one, with their presence, and then get to an economy of scale so as to reduce their costs. So consequently, when they sold the food chain, they picked out the stores that they didn't want that were operating at a loss. So we have to look at ways to incentivize healthy food choices and supermarkets to come into Bayview and Viz Valley. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this next question will go to Mr. Richard. And it's a two-part question, but they appear, these two questions appear to go together um, to me. So um, the question, the major question is how will you work to curb and then turn back uh, the displacement that's going on in District 10 as Bayview and Hunters Point have recently been deemed areas for development that will make our neighborhood unaffordable to the current residents? And going along with this, and how can you 
what do you feel you can do to address the out-migration of African Americans in the city? Well, one, we have to realize that our folks are moving out of San Francisco because they can't afford to live here. And so we have to fix the, the living wages here and make sure that they can afford to stay here. We have to make sure we fix uh, the situation on people being on Section 8 and that they don't, if they have Section 8, let's, and, we, and I'm talking frankly and talking honestly, and if they have Section 8, that they don't move out of San Francisco, they stay in San Francisco. Um, one of the biggest issues on far as, you know, living in public housing issue too is that they're being offered a two-year voucher to leave out of San Francisco. And once they get that two-year voucher, they go to Antioch, Pittsburgh, and so uh, talking to a young lady a couple weeks ago, it took her two years to get back to San Francisco. Why is it that when she was a San Francisco resident? We have to do better than you know, making sure people get back to San Francisco and fixing that issue on sitting down with the Board of Supervisors and working together along putting together legislation and rules of what needs to be done and bring folks back to San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much. There's a couple things that I would do. At first, I would change the lottery system that we spoke of earlier. I would change the way we are handing out um, information. I would also continue to prioritize certificates of preference for folks that have lived here, that have grown here, that have these certificates to remain here when it comes to housing and housing options. I also think we need to increase the pipeline of talent that's coming to San Francisco, actively, re actively recruiting within the African American community, if that's what we're talking about here. So going to HBCUs and saying, hey, listen, we have, a, we have a pre an internship for you at Google. Come work here, and upon, usually upon internships, you're offered a full-time position. That's where we need to begin to start to change and stop, talk, stop giving so much voice just to the out-migration, but also give as much time and energy to the in-migration. Who are we talking to? What are we doing when we're talking about marketing these units? We need to do, um, there needs to be a stronger strategy that I am in the process of, of putting together and getting funded through general fund dollars to begin to talk just expressively to the African American and Latino and people who really have grown up in San Francisco and want to remain here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Donaldson? There are several things. 2009, I helped to write and get passed the Certificate of Preference legislation, which gives the right of first refusal to families who were displaced out of Fillmore and Hunters Point. That's already in place. These people get first priority on all affordable housing, and we have used it both on Jamestown and on the Senior Center at Armstrong Place. We need stronger tenant protections around public housing because of the privatization that's taking place. Everywhere privatization is taking place around the country, there has been some level of displacement. We have to make sure we protect those tenants and make sure that they're not arbitrarily evicted and taken advantage of. You know, when we talk about you know, the, the creating housing opportunities, I think about the listening sessions that took place at the shipyard. Basically what folks said is that we need our own district-wide housing program. Why are we talking about ordinary solutions such as counseling when we live in an extraordinary real estate market? We need to create our own housing program. We can do that through a lease option program which requires a very minimum down payment and allow people to build equity in the units that they will buy. And I'll address more later on. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Sure. In this district, in this neighborhood, if you're talking about in-migration to market rate housing, you are talking about displacement. So let's be clear. We have resilient people throughout District 10. I love them. We want them to stay. But we need also to not be harmful with the policies we've had at City Hall in the last four years because we keep pushing people to be more resilient. We need to help instead of harm. And I am proud to work on the Wealth and Disparities Task Force out of SEIU for the past six months on the community leadership team and where we've been actually working on these exact issues. And in fact, Sean and I are chairs of the employment uh, portion of that task force, where well, one of the things we're talking about is expanding local hire beyond construction into, pub into the public sector, into city jobs, into the healthcare sector. We need to expand those job opportunities because basically housing is too expensive, there aren't enough jobs, and we keep killing people. That is what's going on with the out-migration, and you can see it happening with one four evictions being on city property, one in third of evictions last year being of African Americans. We need to get a handle on this, and it needs to be an emergency, and this board and this city has not been recognizing that in the last four years. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question has to do with Airbnb and Uber. Um, as has been reported, um, Airbnb is supposed to pay hotel taxes. And Uber allegedly is not accommodating people with disabilities. 
What would you do when corporations such as this violate the law? What would you do as a supervisor? And the first question goes to Ms. Cohen. Oh, to me? Yeah. Um, so when people are in violation of law, we, we go after them and we prosecute them. But what's interesting about, the, um, about Airbnb is, is that there are no laws that are created. It's in actually in a very new space. So what we're doing at the board is we're creating legislation to begin to hold the host accountable. And so we, uh, it, it just got out of the land use committee just last week, and it's going to be coming to the full board. So there are no rules just, just as of yet to hold hosts accountable as well as protect, protect, put in protections for, for renters and for the folks that are, that are, that are neighbors to, to the hosts. Now, the allegations with Uber, not, sh not um, in their inability to work with, um, uh, what did you say? The people with disabilities. People with disability. That's something new. I, I don't know if that's a, that's fact or or not. But um, the bottom line is is that Air, Uber is regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission, so there is regulation. And when there are violations, most certainly go after them and, and punish folks and, and hold people accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Donaldson. I think the best uh, thing we can do in regards to uh, businesses that violate the law is to prosecute them. So I agree wholeheartedly with that idea. Um, as it relates to Airbnb and the hotel tax, I think that they should pay the hotel tax because everyone else is paying it. As it relates to Uber, I actually spoke with uh, an executive at Uber maybe about two weeks ago and he said that they were working on a specific line of vehicles that would accommodate people who had disabilities or whatnot. So, you know, once again, I would really work to hold these people uh, accountable. I mean, you can't necessarily stop innovation in a city. I mean, it, it, it's what drives growth and it's what drives economic uh, activity in a city. So it's kind of hard to stop them, but I would, I would make sure that they're regulated in such a way so as to account for the things that they're trying to get around such as taxes and accommodations to people with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's be really clear. The reason there's Airbnb legislation at the board tomorrow is because it is illegal today, as a matter of fact, and that is why there's a $28 million of back hotel taxes on the table that the board is very likely to vote tomorrow to allow them to skate on and not pay. Because apparently in this city that has a huge budget but is too broke to pay attention to our district, $28 million is perfectly fine to give away. So businesses that violate the law but have multinational investors somehow get new laws written to accommodate them. Does that happen out here? No. Does it happen at City Hall for big companies? Yes, it does. So with Uber, you've got a taxi industry that's regulated, and you have a separate industry that does the same thing as taxis that is not regulated. We actually need to take charge of that. The CPUC should not be in charge of that. They operate exactly the same as taxis. We need to make it one industry and get one set of standards there. That will be better for the drivers. It will be better for, for customers. It will actually be better for the companies, too, although Uber doesn't see it that way. Same thing for Airbnb. We need the enforcement, and right now that legislation that the board is likely to pass tomorrow does not have it. Thank you, Mr. Richard. You're right. There's no law, and I agree with them. And, and I think that we have to put together policy that make them and hold them accountable. Bottom line is, again, like Tony Kelly said, $20 million. What are we doing with that and how are we holding them accountable? They need to, we need to put together legislation and make sure that Airbnb is held accountable across the board and stop playing games. We give Twitter tax breaks. We need to start, stop doing all that. This is why the city is suffering now. Again, we have $8.6 billion and we keep on playing around with these districts and making sure that these districts are not fully funded, not accurately done right and treated right, and we have to start holding them accountable across the board. When we start putting things together and we start managing and putting together policy and supervisors start understanding what legislation really is, we can start moving districts forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. This next question, um, according to the writer of the question, uh, DPH has said that Bayview has over 20 drug treatment programs and that program operators seek more. How, what do you think you could do as a supervisor to make these programs more effective and work for the community? What type of programs? Um, drug treatment programs. Drug treatment programs. Yeah. I thought you said junk food programs. No, <laughs> drug treatment programs. Drug treatment programs. Okay. Well, you know, as far as the, the you know, 
people who use drugs and, and, and the types of programs that are out there, um, you know, I think we need to sort of kind of take a step back and we need to look at the whole situation from a holistic perspective and, and look at it from in the context of how, you know, we delivered uh, AIDS-related services here in San Francisco where you had, you know, uh, uh, researchers connected to, you know, community services that were connected co to community advocates and that it was done in a very holistic kind of way so that it was a soft approach and it, and it wasn't necessarily just sort of kind of thrown out there for people to just come through come through but it was more so you know related around you know people coming to realize what you know the problem is that they had and they saw the need to come forward to uh, to actually receive the services so you know i would i would definitely support you know sort of kind of backing up and reevaluating how we are delivering drug related uh, drug treatment services and definitely try something new because if it's broke you know, we definitely have to look at uh, doing something different. You know, as you know, the definition of insanity, too. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? Sure. When I was uh, the vice chair of the Arts Task Force about eight years ago, nine years ago, one of the things we came up with about trying to reshape arts funding in the city was something modeled on the Ryan White Care Council of uh, the Department of Public Health, which is, I believe, part of what Ed was referring to, which is a community-based council of stakeholders, including clients and providers and community, about what the priorities are for year, on a year-to-year -year basis or every couple of years on AIDS funding and trying to reshape that on a rolling basis as, you know, treatment of the epidemic continues. So we actually are spending money on the right things. And it also serves as a secondary way of auditing for outcomes to make sure you're actually delivering results to the community. It's a good model for the arts. It's a great model in public health for AIDS funding. It's probably a good model here. And that's what I, I would want to look at because you want to work with the stakeholders to do it at the same time. It's not something that's going to come top down and say not, not just we need more auditing. We do. But we need more auditing with the community and with the stakeholders and with the agencies because it's a pretty easy guess to know the funding might be misplaced. Thank you very much, Mr. Richard. Can you repeat the question again, please? Sure. Uh, according to DPH, Bayview has over 20 drug treatment programs. Program operators seek more. How would you make these programs more effective? Well, one of the things is, is that, again, I come from a prevention part, and we have over 750 organizations in District 10. And we have organizations that's getting funded, and we see no outcome. And we have drug programs. I don't know where the 20 drug programs are at. I haven't seen them. Um, and, and, and some of the folks in here are saying the same thing. But I think at the same time, we have to take a look at Who's, who's doing what and what they're doing, and we have to evaluate them and, and figure out what the outcomes are. What, what are they doing to be productive and how are they helping the folks that's on drugs and that's trying to get off drugs? We say a lot, and we, we don't do a lot. We, we, know, we, we, say, we say we're going to do this and we're going to do that, but we show no evidence that we have produced those type of evidence on making folks get off drugs and be able to sustain a, a, a successful life. I think that we have to evaluate what programs are getting funded and go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Cohen. Thank you. When I hear the fact that there are over 20 drug treatment programs in one neighborhood, you know what I think of? I think about that's way too much for one little neighborhood to shoulder. <clears throat> and when I think about, um, like, for example, there were some questions about, like, what are these treatment programs? Uh, the methadone clinic is one example, housed in, an, in, a, um, in a residential neighborhood. And that presents a lot of problems for the residents because you have people coming in that for treatment, but you also have people that, uh, that are living there and that are walking their kids to school and going to school and going to, going to work and taking the transportation. And so that actually has an impact on the quality of life. So when I think about this, this number 20, I think about an over-concentration of services for an area that is overly saturated and it's unfair. I think we need to have more of an equitable distribution of services that's spread out across the entire city. Also paying attention that we have community planning that took place that has designated a health node right here in the baby community. And a lot of our health services need to be concentrated in this health node around the Southeast Health Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, this is going to be our final question for the evening, and we're going to start with Mr. Kelly. How will you, if elected, work with the community to bring equal opportun opportunities to the community? I think, I think two things. First, in relation to the last question, one of the fallacies of the rezoning of the city, where we rezoned 80% rezone of the District 10, is somehow if you zone in gold mines, you will discover gold. 
and that's not true. And similarly, if you try to reduce the services here, it does not automatically get rid of the people who need those services. We've actually been trying that. That's why we have more homeless on the streets. That's why you see more people who need services out there. So you need contact. You need more case management, more direct contact. And one thing that I would do personally about that, may not be a direct answer to the question, but it's pretty close, is having community office hours every single day of the year. Me or my staff in Bayview Hunters Point and a few times a week in Viz Valley and once a week or so in Petrero because they'll be fine and they know where I live. But the point is you need that contact so you can always reach the supervisor's office without going to City Hall and make it a one-stop shop. It's no longer a question of, should not be longer be a question of, oh, that's another agency, that's not our purview. Oh, it's another department, you can't, we can't talk about that. Oh, it's the school district, that's not our problem. It's all our problem. We all need to work together every day. Richard. One of the problems, Ben, is that the city has not been connected to City Hall. I mean, the community have not been connected to City Hall. We have not had a voice that can speak up and say, hey, this is what needs to be done and bring the city, to, bring the city and the community together. I will facilitate that by bringing everybody together across the board in all, in all areas by working with them one-on-one. -on -one. When, when Mayor Gavin Newsom was elected and when Count Kamala Harris was elected, they asked me to be on their transition team. That's what I will put in place, a transition team, where we meet once a month and we facilitate on working together on trying to put everybody in place, in order, on giving the community what they need. And, and the problem is that we have not had that voice to speak up and come together and say, hey, come with me and walk with me and work with me and let's bring this voice that I have from, from the community to City Hall and bridge the gap. We have been displaced and we have, have not had no communication across the board. So we have to make sure that the community again, have a say-so. I say this all the time. The District 10 supervisor works for the district. The district don't work for the, the district did not work for the, the community did not work for the district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Thank you very much. When I think about um, working with the community, two words come into mind, listening and then responding. Listening to the neighborhood, listening to the residents and the tenant associations, listening to the association, to the neighborhood associations, listening to the CAC, listening to the, the different policy bodies, and then creating policies to move forward to address the problems, whether it's blight, whether it's fair housing ordinance for, um, for jobs, whether we're rebuilding public housing or creating a mandatory mediation program to address the foreclosures. In the end, it's a it's very simple principle, listening and responding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Donaldson. I'm going to borrow a line from my mentor, uh, Dr. Uh, or Mrs. Eloise Westbrook. She said that somehow or another we've gotten confused that we work for politicians versus politicians working for us and how true, sh how true that statement is. You know, and I also I had a youngster who asked me, you know, I was talking to, he asked me, could I get him a job if I got elected? And I told him no. I told him what I could do, and, and, and let me say this, I told him how many people have come before me and have promised you a job? and you still don't have one, right? So I told him, I said, what I will do, I will stand up and fight. What I will do, I will help you to organize that has resulted in the $1.2 million that we got for that park across the street. I will help you to organize in a way where we confronted the banks when we didn't, we didn't believe or we couldn't get any help from City Hall and we didn't like the policies that they had in regards to how they were dealing with homeowners in Bayview around foreclosures. I will help you to organize to get your house back as we've done with several members of the community where we just confronted the banks and got the houses back. You know? So when government ceases to work for you, I mean, you have no alternative but to speak up and speak out. So I would help the community to organize in that way. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Now we come to the candidates' closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you aren't registered to vote, please do so right away and urge others you know to register. It's very important to be registered to vote and then exercise the vote when you do register. The actual deadline is October 20th, and if you've moved you need to register again at your new address. We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order. And remember, candidates, you have two minutes to give your closing statement. Mr. Richard, we will start with you. Thank you for having me this tonight. My name is Sean Richard, and I'm running for District 10 Supervisor, not because I want to gain a, a, a 
a fame or glory or a salary is because I've been doing this for 20 years and I've been in the community fighting and supporting and helping residents across the board. I know what needs to be done. I didn't showed up to every single funeral within, with this year that happened in this district. And so families are grieving, families are hurt, and families are, are in pain. I have worked with the seniors and, 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 and gave my support around them. I know what needs to be done across the, across the board. Working with Ms. Mason, she had gave me a lot of insight on what the seniors are lacking and what they need and what they want. Working with the young folks in the community, talking to them, dealing with them, and working with them, helping them with employment, helping them trying to get their education. I know that they're suffering, and if you look down and you drive up and down Third Street, you see families struggling, it's families sad. You see young mothers pushing their babies and holding their babies, and they're struggling. Unemployment is high in District 10. Here we have 4% unemployment rate in San Francisco, but yet 12% in San Francisco over in Bayview. That's unacceptable. We have to fix that. We have to do better, and we have to make sure that we understand as a community, we come first. We have families living in toxic neighborhoods, toxic issues in houses, and they're not being supported by housing authority. We have to fix that. We have to make sure we understand the outcome of every living family in District 10. They get the equal right across the board. If it was up in Knob Hill, if it was up in, um, um, up in top of the housing project, we have to support that. I think that I can fix that. I know the community. I work with the community. I've been out there, and I understand the issues. So I ask you, you have three choices. Make me one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kelly? Sure. District 10, we are in the middle of the most unequal district in the most unequal city in America, and it's the policies of the last four years that have put us there. Our, our district suffers first and worst. We did it when the recession hit a few years ago, and we're doing it now in the boom times. That's, for too many people, it's, we're being left out, pushed out, locked out, and locked up. Yes, we're resilient, but we got to stop doing that kind of damage. And these are all problems. Unemployment, infant mortality, violence, these are all problems that are bigger than one person. But if there's one person who should be working full time every day on those issues, it's the District 10 supervisor. And we don't have that today. That's why I'm running. My history is with building, my history is with building neighborhood coalitions across neighborhoods. Been doing that from the Mission to South of Market, been doing it along the waterfront, and that's why I have support throughout the District 10 and neighborhood associations from Viz Valley to Bayview Hill to Petrero Hill, why I have the support of San Francisco Rising, our leading advocates for low-income workers and families of color, and recently the Black Leadership Forum gave me one of their three endorsement votes. I'm very honored to get that because it shows that I can build coalitions across the district and try to bring that so we can actually improve the district for everyone. I'm not a trained politician. My training is in neighborhood advocacy. That's what I want to bring to the board. I'm not there trying to count votes and be the swing vote. I'm not trying to plan for a future election. I'm not there meeting with lobbyists more than I meet with the Board of Supervisors and the community. That's need, we need to have a change to do that. That's why we need, that's why I want to have community office hours in the district every single day of the year because no district needs a neighborhood supervisor who works every day for the neighborhoods more than District 10. Thank you for listening, and please vote on the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. Donaldson. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters as well as the other sponsors that uh, helped to put this forum on and to give us the opportunity to get our ideas out and to not only get our ideas out but to talk about the work that we have done. And um, I'm not going to recap about you know the, the stuff that I've been working on because I've been doing it for 10 years now. But what I do want to point out is that as a father who has raised three uh, successful children, college educated children, I understand what it means and what it takes to raise a child in this neighborhood and to get them off to a successful start. What I have for my children, I want for everybody else's child, and that's why I stand and that's why I fight. As a finance professional, I worked on the exchange here in San Francisco. I saw the economic crash of 1987. I see the same things happen again. What I decided to do was to use my uh, finance background. I have a degree from San Francisco State. I have a, a, a development certificate from the University of uh, Southern California. I'm a certified economic development finance professional. I am qualified to do this work, and I have been doing this work. But I decided to use my expertise here in the community where it is most needed. So, you know, I say you do have three votes. If I'm not your first choice, make me your second choice or your third choice. But nonetheless, win, lose, or draw, you will hear from me 
because I will continue to stand and do the work that I've been doing in this district and in this community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Cohen. Thank you. Um, thank you to the League for taking the moment and organizing not just the video not just and the questions. Thank you to our community partners, and thank you to the audience that took time to come out and, uh, and listen. And what you heard really were a lot of um, really interesting ideas. The reality is, is that the challenges that we have been facing and living with for, for generations has existed before I got on the board and will it continue to exist um, if not managed and if not dealt with will continue to exist. And that is really where we need to draw the line. What we actually need right now is experience. I'm committed to keeping this district affordable, to keeping it working, to keep people healthy and safe. And I have a demonstrated track record where I've passed legislation, where I've advocated, where I've been your champion, and I have got you those general fund dollars. And I've delivered on major acquisitions all across the district, not just in Bayview, all ethnicities, not just African American, all people in social economic class, not just living in public housing or living or, or on uh, living and owning their own house. We need consistency and we need tough, bold thoughts and leadership. And you have that. And you will continue to have that. Win, lose, or draw. I've been here and I'm going to remain here with you every step of the way. Please support me. My name is Malia Cohen. I am your supervisor and I would love to be reelected again. Thank you. Let's give them all a round of applause, please. I'm going to go a little bit off script here because I've been to a, a few forums uh, this year and in past years, and I can see by doing those forums how hard it is to run for office. And for somebody to take the time from their lives and from their families' lives to do this, I, th I think it's just fantastic. And you know, you got all my respect, all my respect. Now I'm going to go back on script. On behalf of myself, the League of Women Voters, and our partner organization, our thanks to the candidates for participating, and thanks to each of you for taking the time to inform yourself about your choices on November 4th. I wish you all a good evening and a safe trip home. Good night.